So today I'm speaking to you from the shade of this beautiful Bodhi tree near where I'm staying. So it's a new location for you, but not for me. I come here, past here on Pindapart each day. And thought this morning, well, it's usually shady, quiet spot. We'll try and sit and talk here for a change. And I'll begin with the questions and comments, talking about those today. Uh, this, uh, just to the Bodhi tree is behind me. Uh, this here is the Bodhi tree, the, tr the same uh, species of tree that the Buddha sat under in Bodh Gaya, northeastern India, and attained to enlightenment. It will be probably in the lineage of that original tree, being as most Bodhi trees here in Sri Lanka are have come from cuttings of the, which was a cutting of the original millennia ago, it is said. And here, this bit of building you might be able to see, is what they call a Buddha house. They have a little temple, which is with a Buddha Rupa, and uh, they offer candles, incense, flowers each day as part of their devotional practice here in Sri Lanka. So, beginning with the, apologies, I didn't get them ready beforehand, no excuses, I forgot, okay, ah, I'm a bit late, but I was wondering, as someone wanting to become Buddhist, can I choose my daily prayers, or do they have to be specific. Okay, well, I don't think you're late. It doesn't matter what age we are. One can start practicing Buddhism in accordance with the teacher teachings of the Buddha at any time. Of course, the earlier we start, the longer we have to practice and the more chance we have to develop a practice that will lead us out of suffering within this lifetime towards Nibbana, the end goal, freedom from suffering and rebirth. However, we have experienced many lifetimes previously and it isn't known what we have done with those. Even if you're not of the inclination to believe in previous lives, through this practice you will come to understand that this is how we have arrived in this life, our birth into aging, sickness and death, which is what this existence really is, has come about as a result of causes and conditions that were put in place. Now of course, in biological, genetic and physical material terms, this is in relation to our parentage, our parents, and our birth. But how that, uh, how we arrive at that is uh, actually as a result of many more causes and conditions that have been put in place prior to us coming into this world. This, however, is to be understood and experienced by yourself, not believed by me. And in terms of prayers, well, there are some chanting. We don't really call it prayers. This may be a translation, but we'll, it gets translated as prayers here also. Um, but it isn't a prayer. A prayer is a question. It's asking of something. I pray you do this. I, I pray for success, I pray for health, I pray for wealth. Now in the practice of Buddhism we are not praying, 
but we are reflecting on the teachings of the Buddha who taught us how to achieve uh, that we uh, are healthy and all of these beneficial factors one might ask a god in heaven above or a higher power for we looked for that to achieve that within ourselves from our own activities of body speech and mind those actions we call karma and the results of those actions we call karma is vipaka the results and it is that that results in how we end up in or at this place at this time in this present moment and only in this time in this present moment can we determine anything as to what happens next by those very actions of body speech and mind what we do here and now so whether you're early or late in life what you decide to do from now here in after is what will determine your course the pattern of your life to come and if you choose to keep five precepts if you choose to practice meditation and develop wholesome mind states then the results can really be considered to only be good from here in after because you're putting in the causes and conditions for a rebirth right here and now into the future now we cannot determine or do anything about the future and it is better in order to avoid increased suffering suffering not to have too much by way of expectations of the future because expectations can lead to disappointment will lead to disappointment ultimately as i began with we are born into aging sickness and death this is an impermanent state in which we uh, uh, exist currently and <clears throat> there is nothing of this conditioned world all conditioned things are impermanent and it isn't a striving to uh, improve the current state of this conditioned life externally but more internally with our view so this is a kind of summary of what the Buddha or how the Buddha is teaching us to behave, live and practice and this can be found in our Buddhist chanting books there is one you can find the links to uh, various places I think on in these comments but if you google one that has both the Pali language and English language if you google what Mark Jan chanting book it will come up a downloadable PDF book and in there are the core sequences of the chanting or prayers as you call them that you can use as reflections and some of them that's what they're called merely that reflections on the teachings of the Buddha and what we use in our lives how we use those things our requisites as we call them and really ways of really improving your life from now on so it isn't too late and they are the prayers you can pick and choose from you don't have to if you're practice keeping the precepts practicing meditation it is enough but this can be assisted supported by also this uh, chanting that you've shown an interest in so yes you can choose them and they don't have to be specific you may have some other lines or words you want to use as a chant or a mantra and that's also fine in accordance with the teachings of the Buddhas, Buddha but whatever's making you feel well and is working for you. Uh, oh, what happened to your middle finger? I think there's a video already answering that. Just search on this channel that exact question. It'll come up, I think. Uh, I'm not sure what that one means. Okay, this is quite a, a, a long-winded question, but don't worry, it's a short answer. People who enjoyed the worldly pleasures for years, say like 20 to 30 years. Sorry, it began with consider two sets of people. <clears throat> One, people who enjoyed the worldly pleasures for years, say like 20 to 30 years, 
and two, so this is the second set, people who enjoyed or experienced world, worldly pleasures very less or never experienced it. Maybe because they had only less opportunities or because of having less desirable natural traits. For example, people who have never tasted good food because of poverty, people who were avoided because of their disfigurement, or people who never experienced romantic love because of their undesirable physical traits. If a person from the former set become a monk after decades of enjoying material pleasures, and if a person from the latter category becomes a monk early on in their life, who will find enlightenment earlier slash easier? Question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. We don't know. This is the basis of karma. It cannot be understood fully because it comes also from actions of previous lives. So, if you have put everything in place in a previous life to build what we call parami, which are qualities that help lead us to enlightenment, including generosity, patience, meditation, uh, renunciation, truthfulness, uh, energy in your practice, um, uh, I think that that's kind of most of them. There are ten parami. Uh, there is a Pali list in the Theravada tradition of these ten qualities. It doesn't come up in the suttas. They are actually noted or referred to in separate suttas. It isn't an actual one of the Buddha's lists, but they're often quoted as qualities we develop in this life and in previous lives. Now, the Buddha said also, one of the questions perhaps not to try and waste your time thinking about because your mind will explode is how karma works because we've had countless unquantifiable number of previous lives we don't know what we've done in those lives unless we've had the ability to get really close towards enlightenment and experience and know what see those former lives so you may be born into an unfortunate set of circumstances in this life to pay back something terrible you've done just once in one life, but you may have spent many, many lives doing good. And therefore you could attain to enlightenment very quickly, whereas the person born into fortunate circumstances, which is summing up what you're saying, someone who's in unfortunate circumstances becoming a monk, and someone who's in fortunate circumstances becoming a monk, who will become enlightened more quickly. It doesn't matter. It's what you do from therein afterwards. So if you just become a monk, having come from a wonderful situation, okay, yes, you're giving up more, maybe. You're renouncing worldly life and the pleasures that it entails. If you're coming from an unfortunate background, you're actually possibly even improving your living conditions. Now, certainly there are some restrictions as to who can ordain. You have to be physically and mentally healthy to ordain uh, because it is the nature of our practice, our training, that you have to be well in order to be able to carry it out and practice and live in a community or alone as a monk. So this has to be considered. But should those two different kinds of backgrounded people enter into monastic life, there is no knowing who will become enlightened first, if any of them. It is dependent on the parami they've built up in this life. So all of those qualities I said, generosity, truthfulness, effort, uh, meditation, truth, etc. And also that of previous countless lifetimes prior to this one. So it's an unanswerable, unanswerable question. But I didn't want to just say, I just don't know. But also, that does also explain the inexplicableness of karma. So, for instance, there's two ways of looking at it. The person giving up a lavish lifestyle to become a monk is stronger in terms of renunciation, perhaps, than someone who's coming from a very impoverished background 
to live in a relatively, by comparison, comfortable monastery. However, um, the person coming from the uh, poorer background uh, isn't so strong in renunciation, but will have less uh, drawback, pullback, uh, clinging to his past life and more uh, find more comfort in his new life, his new existence. Uh, the other may, as a result of the renunciation and the realization that he didn't find contentment and happiness in his former life, have more power to push him towards enlightenment more quickly also. So there's very many different ways to look at both those situations and arrive at different answers. Achintaya is a Pali term for imponderable and there are four imponderables the Buddha talked about. The origins of the universe, the how karma works, um, the infinite wisdom and powers of the Buddha and uh, I've forgotten the fourth. I'm always forgetting one of them. But it'll do for now. Is there imponderable what he said that if you spend your life think or spend any amount of time really thinking about it and in his words he said your head will explode and this will happen not literally but you could spend a lifetime trying to work out the absolute origins of the universe or the end of the universe what came before what came afterward how can you ever know you cannot scientifically it might be able to be arrived at some formula uh, but you cannot experience that. But what you can experience is freedom from suffering in this lifetime, and that's what he taught us. In which place it is happening? What? Ah, this is my robe <laughs> dying um, thing. This is here, just my Vihara, which is about 100 yards behind me from this tree. Uh, so this tree is located... Uh, I, you often see me in, on the beach there talking to you and this is just uh, to the right of that in front of my Vihara. <laughs> I'm not up to giving you a guided tour on a video, I don't do that sort of thing. But it's all very close and where that robe dyeing video is happening is, is in Sri Lanka. I think that's what you mean, which country. Uh, hello, do I have to go to where you are to join your community? So I was reading the next question as well to see if it, I could put them together, but I can't. Um, sorry, how, uh, hello, how do I have to go to where you are to join your community and hope you, and hope you get, I think it's a bit miss, m missing there. Not sure. Anyway, uh, no, uh, this, this isn't so much a community. I'm a monk living alone, uh, so that's not much of a community in which I'm living. So there's no need to come, anyone to come here, although anyone is very welcome to come here and visit me. And there's plenty of accommodation around here. There isn't, I don't live in a monastery, so there's no free accommodation, but there's inexpensive local accommodation around these parts nearby and um, I will always welcome and have done so far quite a few now visitors from various places to uh, practice meditation with me if they wish or just ask questions or come to this beautiful country for a holiday but no you don't have to come to join the community this community if you're referring to in terms of there is a, a community here online of people whom have uh, subscribed to, to this channel and this channel I contribute these uh, talks from time to time it's grown and many of those subscribers have been here since the beginning and certainly are the basis of what is an online community because we have email correspondence um, they help me and support me I hopefully help them and support them in their practice and this is a very good way of forming what we call Kalyanamita, noble friends, friends on the path, people with the same idea of practicing uh, the teachings of the Buddha. So you don't have to come here. Uh, and then your next question. So yes, just keep watching and joining in. 
The next question is, I always practice alone, but being in a community means full dedication. Am I correct? Um, well, not necessarily. Uh, ordination certainly means full dedication because you're renouncing worldly life, but living in a community per se is not necessarily that. There are, if you're wondering what that is, this is a lady or some one selling probably something. If you speak Sinhalese, you'll know what she's shouting. This is a little, the little village where I walk around in the park. There's little houses. So <laughs> she's doing her reverse pinder part, selling cloths or fish or herbs or something. So, yes, so now full dedication is your dedication to the practice, keeping the precepts and, pract and practicing meditation. And this is developing wisdom. And if you can do that outside of a community, but with the support of, say, a virtual community like this, and I will help to support you if I can, then that's, that's good also. Of course, uh, you're semi-correct if you mean ordination, because that is fully dedicating your life to the practice and renouncing worldly life. But you can be just as dedicated in worldly life, as I spoke about at some length. I don't know whether it was in the last video or the one before that, but it's been a, a running theme just recently. Okay. Have you spoken about the five remembrances at length? I would really appreciate you to talk about this one day. I recount these sometimes more if the complaining mind is loud and clinging. Yes, it's good to do that. So part of that chanting book, you'll find in the chanting book I mentioned, Wat Marp Jan chanting book, a downloadable PDF, uh, the one I use. I don't use because I, I know the chanting, but uh, I pick little bits in my head that I like to say each morning for the live chanting, which incidentally is at 6 a.m. Indian time. I think someone asked that question, what time is that? Uh, every day but you can find that if you look at the live section of this channel and it stays on there so you can watch it anytime but in that book are the five subjects for frequent recollection there are also ten subjects for frequent recollection but that's more for monks and nuns but for lay people and monks and nuns are the five subjects for frequent recollection and I haven't talked at length a particular a whole Dharma talk on the subject maybe I will soon but each and every day i've already mentioned in this video along with other aspects of the training sila samadhi panya moral virtue meditation developing wisdom and anicca dukkha anatta impermanence suffering and not self i often mention aging sickness and death not even in the pali just straightforward english we're born into aging sickness and death these are the three of those first reflections and one of the chants of our evening chanting or morning chanting but evening chanting I think usually is um, that we reflect upon uh, we are of the nature to get old, we are of the nature to get sick, we are of the nature to die. We are the heirs, we are the, the creators of our karma and the heirs to our karma and those that we hold dear we will, will be parted from. So, aging, sickness, death, heirs to our karma, and all we hold dear in terms of material assets and things, and people we love, we will be parted from. Either they will die or we will die. These are the three subjects, sorry, five subjects for frequent recollection. Now why? It's because that reminds us of the reality, the truth of life, the truth of anicca, dukkha, anatta, and the urgency to practice sila, samadhi, panya. And although I may not have spoken of it at length, the backbone, the structure of anything I'm speaking about in a Dharma talk, or perhaps basing the answers to any of my questions, or your questions, or comments that I'm making, are uh, founded around that understanding because it is important that we are continually reflecting on this. As monks, we have something called Maranasati, which is reflection or contemplation on death, that of our own and all beings, because being of the nature to get old, get sick and die, 
knowing this is a great way of stimulating the urgency to practice, to become free from suffering in this lifetime, seeing the very real reality of imminent death and therefore the uh, whole process beginning again of rebirth into samsara, of growing, old, growing up, education, working, maybe finding Buddhism, maybe not, living, getting old, sick, dying, going over and over again. So to step out of this, uh, this uh, cycle of birth and rebirth, um, death and birth, we need to do something about it. And in order to invo evoke urgency, we reflect on those five sub subjects. Hence, they're called the five subjects for frequent recollection, which you refer to as the five remembrances. So this is an interesting one. A Vinaya question. If you were to fall and I wanted to extend my hand to help you up, would I be allowed to as a female? So you're allowed to do anything you like as a female, um, and not a monk or a nun. Uh, in terms of the Vinaya, I would uh, say I've fallen, uh, then uh, I would in accordance with the Vinaya, re refuse your offer of help and wait for a male to assist me up. Say it was a serious fall. Um, now, with all of these Vinaya rules, there is always the exception that in sickness, there is some flexibility within reason. Uh, and uh, if it is uh, going to um, it's dangerous, so uh, say, say I'd fallen off, a, off a, a ledge and was going to fall into a ravine and a, a lady was to offer her hand to stop me falling in and pull me out, a strong lady, um, then uh, given the alternative of death, uh, I think that would be considered as a reasonable exception. Technically, though, we have no contact with ladies. Uh, or men as, as such, but it's quite very definite with ladies, which a lady cannot even hand me anything directly. She can put something in my bowl, Pindabata, or if she wants to offer me something that doesn't go into my bowl, it needs to be put onto a piece of cloth which I am holding and I pull it towards me like this. This is to avoid accidental contact uh, with the opposite sex, and it works the other way around for bhikkhunis, so uh, female monks, nuns. So you're, 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 you're right, and it's a good question to think about this. Uh, I would say if you see an old monk who's fallen down, Sukihoto sadhu, 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 then uh, don't let that put you off offering a hand to help, but offer, and he can refuse. It is our responsibility to uphold the Vinaya. It is important that we remember that. It's one of the reflections that we are the we are responsible for our karma and the heirs to our karma, not other people's. So whatever you do, you cannot affect someone else's karma. You can put in causes and conditions for them to break or precepts, not keep precepts, or to um, therefore create uh, uh, not good karma, unwholesome karma, bad karma, um, but this is still their choice and they will be the they will be the heirs, they will have the results, the vipaka, the positive or negative. So we, we, you can still offer your hand, uh, maybe tentatively, don't grab, you know, this would, might be inappropriate. But a good question. What's your views on drinking coffee and or coffee enemas? I've already expressed my views on drinking coffee many times, and it's nothing wrong with drinking coffee. It is not an intoxicant, it is a stimulant. Coffee, caffeine, nicotine are stimulants. Uh, they don't affect the mind in the same way that intoxicants affect the mind. So by comparison to alcohol, you can drink coffee, still drive cars, pilot aeroplanes, or trainfuls, coachfuls of passengers after coffee, and cigarettes, no problem. After alcohol and marijuana, big problem. Your life, their lives are at risk. This is the Q. 
huge difference. So there's nothing wrong with drinking coffee, but all things in excess are bad for you. And as regards to the second part of your question, I've no idea what on earth that can mean. I've got an idea, but I mean, how it's related to coffee. I don't know, I don't, I don't know, sorry. Well, I'm not sorry, I just, I don't, hope I don't need to know, ever, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, okay, could you make some comments about why even bitter sweet truth is better than sweet lies according to Buddhism? I struggle with the fourth precept and often find myself lying, I must admit. I almost feel guilty about it. Thank you, Bante. I s if I say I will do something and I don't do it, it is, a, is it considered lying? So don't lie and don't make promises you can't keep and then you won't have any of these problems. This is why we have the precepts. So if you say you're going to do something and you have good in or every intention to do it and you're unable for whatever, to do it, this isn't specifically lying, so it isn't breaking the fourth precept. But if you just say, as often people do, yes, I'll do it for you later, knowing you're not going to, or even intending to, but if something better comes along, you'll choose that and put aside what you'd promised to do, then in my book, that's as bad as lying, but it isn't really specifically lying. I treat the five precepts quite literally no killing, I don't extend it to no harm because everything else is covered in the Noble Eightfold Path. Um, but the precepts are hard enough to keep as it is, so keep them simple. Don't expand upon what is already there. So in terms of the fourth precept, I keep it as no lying. I don't expand it to harmful speech, gossip, uh, useless speech, because that's covered under right speech, the third point part of the Noble Eightfold Path, which covers all aspects of speech. So keep the precepts simple. They're hard enough, as you're ex ex saying yourself, to keep anyway. So don't make it more difficult. So no lying is just that. And as far as sweet, bittersweet, uh, this, these descriptions, however poetic they may sound, I mean, there's no bittersweet lying. If, uh, okay, you may be saying something that's a little untrue, you might call a white lie, because you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. I think it's better to tell them the truth or say nothing at all. Then you're not lying. Just don't lie. Now, it might be difficult to get used to, but I've managed to do it for a long time now, and it isn't that difficult um, once you get used to it. Because you can always say nothing. No comment, as I think people say, or used to say in police interviews, for instance, uh, then you're not committing yourself either way. It might sound a little strange at first, but it almost so, it's the way you say it. It might add a little bit of light-heartedness and humour. So if somebody says to you, in all, um, uh, asks to you, in all honesty, to, to you, and it, do I look okay in this? Yes, and you were to say, no, you look awful, uh, because they look awful, then this would be quite harmful and rude and, and not appropriate or nice. But if you were to say, yes, you look uh, fine, you look beautiful, and they were to go out and they clearly didn't look very good at all, then you'd be doing them a disservice. So in that circumstance, you could say with a laugh, <laughs> no comment, and I'm sure they're going to get what you mean and change into something else. So there's no such thing as this bittersweet, sweet lies and lies are lies. You're saying that bitter truth is better than sweet lies, according to Buddhism. So, I mean, I've never heard, this is not something from the suttas, it's maybe a little phrase that's come about, but I hope I've, I've justified your question in, in, in my answer there. Uh, I have no idea what time I started talking, so I'll just do maybe one more, maybe two. Looking to do a full isolated forest retreat meditation hall. What should I do for meditation and chanting? So I'm not sure that's supposed to say hall. 
forest retreat. I'm not really sure I understand the question. Uh, so please, if you recognize that, can you send me an email? If I can support you in any way with uh, whatever uh, chanting material, meditation uh, advice you need, I'm more than happy to do so. And that goes for anybody wanting to start meditation retreats or hold group activities. I'm very happy and willing to support you in any way I can. But this is, needs to be a little bit more specific, so maybe email me with what it is you're getting at, because uh, I'm not really sure I understand the, the question. It, I hope that's okay. And the email address is in the description under the video. If it's, I think so, englishbuddhistmonk at gmail.com. Oh, Hare Krishna, my brother. <laughs> This is the greeting, salutation. Do you feel, I'm not laughing, that's, that's fine, Hare Krishna to you also, but I'm a Buddhist monk, so I mean, that, that's just sounds, my brother. Do you feel, do you feel adverse karmic effects from people touching your feet? No, I can't say I do. Uh, now, um, you're probably referring to uh, the Pindapata videos, many people in Sri Lanka here, they, they touch your feet. And that concludes ladies, strangely enough, with the whole touching thing. But um, uh, I must say something as a Western person I'm not used to. I'm used to it now. So I've been in India and Thailand for a long time. Uh, not so much in Thailand either do they do that, but in India they do. Uh, it's um, certainly, do I don't think it has any effect on karma or I feel any adverse karma in terms of my understanding of karma. But your understanding of karma, being as your salutation was Hare Krishna, is probably different to mine. But as I've just explained, karma is just actions. So they are not doing bad actions. It's devotional practice touching the feet of... Uh, they're not my feet they're touching. They're touching the feet of the Sangha. So they're bowing to these robes. It's not me, it's representation, representative of the Sangha. They're touching feet of a faceless personalityness, identity of the feet of the Sangha. So it is a respectful, they call Namaskara in India, a respectful way of uh, bowing and just touching three times the feet of a holy person. It's part of devotional practice. So no, I don't feel anything bad about that. I did feel a little uncomfortable, but that's just because of one's own pers wrong view, personality view, um, and uh, ego perhaps, and uh, you know, not being used to uh, that happening in one's own culture. Uh, can you share, so if you don't mind, can you share about how you afford life? I have anxieties about that. Are you staying in a monastery? Can women live there? So don't have anxieties about that. If there are anxieties about how you can afford life yourself, then um, I can understand it's, it, that's where post, probably most people's anxieties come from, uh, uh, worries about money and such like and very much try and simplify your life into the practice with renunciation and uh, cut down on the things you don't need so you don't have to worry about money so much if you can. As far as my life is concerned, as I've explained many times and probably in all of the videos, I'm fully supported. We don't use money at all as monks. Lay people um, give me food each day, robes, shelter and medicine. So please watch more of these videos and hopefully they will uh, allay your anxiety both about my own circumstances and your, yours. Uh, as far as living in a monastery at the moment, no, I live in a little vihara, a little house, shelter, just a room really, that you can see the extent of if you watch the live chanting in the morning. That's where I live. It's just one room. I live on the floor. Very simple very inexpensive but it is provided by local people um, and it is you know things there it does have electricity it does have water those things have to be paid for that is by the support of lay followers um, of the Sangha 
whom when making dana offerings to me are offering to the sangha who in turn uh, have stewards and people in place to pay the bills if that makes sense so uh, should you want to come go yourself as a lady and live in a monastery there are places I'm not sure what country you're in so again this happens quite often people ask me this question without knowing what country you're in I can't easily direct you um, and even so probably only if you were in England am I able to because it's the only country where I have first-hand experience and know where I'm directing you to but please uh, send me an email or ask me again not in this string but a new comment and then I'll pick up your question later on as this is the last question I, I think so anyway I will uh, maybe go over time and this is in relation to sexual desire I think it must be <laughs> How about a shower every time? Would that work? Maybe not to a full extent. And my answer is probably not, not just a shower or a cold shower. Um, you know, this whole aspect of sexual, of sexual desire, it's about, it is about discipline, but discipline is supported by sensual restraint. So we restrain our senses we guard our senses not restrain we don't suppress the desire we stop adding fuel to the desire so if sexual desire is arising don't go and have a cold shower because you know you're going to be getting undressed and getting in the cold shower and this that and the other it is better to just divert your attention to something really not that's not going to fuel that desire so avert your gaze or what you were listening to stop looking at or stop listening to whatever it was that stimulated this arising of desire in the first place and this is applicable to any desire for food for anything uh, that's a craving a tendency uh, a thirst and just uh, avert the the sense either seeing hearing smelling tasting or touching away from that stimulation and more so and in addition direct it to something less uh, stimulating so maybe start reading some suttas or something like that in the Pali Canon or read anything that isn't going to stimulate that desire so dampen the fire rather than adding fuel to it that's going to be better than a cold shower Cold showers are good for invigorating energy, the blood circulation, and this and that and the other, and probably not good for dampening. There is an expression, all take a cold shower, but I don't know that in every case that's going to be a good idea if, with reference to what you're referring to. I think you just uh, keep uh, mindful about guarding those sense doors, and this is sensual restraint and this is what we practice in, in in everything in our lives to try and try and reduce desire because after all it is this reduction of desire that is ultimately the liberation from samsara what frees us from suffering in this lifetime freedom from this thirst this craving this insatiable uh, desire for that that cannot be satisfied so hopefully that's uh, useful to you and if there's something there you will be able to use it if not just let it go thank you for watching until next time suki hotu be happy and stay well i can go that way because you walk around these trees only clockwise these bodhi trees or stupas or temples so when I came in, it wasn't for effect, <laughs> stage, entering stage left or anything. It was because I wouldn't cut across this way, because that would be going anti-clockwise around the Bodhi tree. And this is a holy sacred place, sacred place where I'm sitting and talking to you. Uh, so I have respect for that and the people that have put this beautiful place here and that I'm fortunate to be able to use. So that's why I'll go that way out 
whereas I came this way in. If that's of any interest at all, it's a point. <laughs> oh, I have to remember to get up carefully. And those of you who have been watching these videos for a while will already know why that is. Normally I'm a little bit more springy, <laughs> springy even at my ageing sickness and nearing death time of life.